like you ever felt. Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Welcome into the rantings of a fantasy football fanatic. I am your host, Jesse Moeller, a.k.a. Moeller 5 and we are rolling right through our Getting to Know series. We are on our seventh or eighth edition already, and I've been just interviewing a lot of different people in the space who I find interesting. If it goes from people who produce content, people who play fantasy football, people who are associated with injuries, people manage salary cap leagues. So we're, we're kind of just touching base with everyone. And the person who I'm bringing on is somebody who I actually touched base with a long time ago, who we got connected in a pretty interesting way, which we can hit up on that um, as we get into it. But found them on Twitter. Um, it is my buddy, Cody. So I'm going to bring him on and let him introduce himself. So, hey, Cody, how you doing? Good, man. How are you? I am good. I want to thank you for taking your time out of your day to come and be on the show. Hey, dude. You know, I know uh, our time zones don't necessarily mesh well being a complete west coast and east coaster talking but mm -hmm. hey, i got a few buddies on the west coast so I'm, I'm pretty used to it yeah it's it's for me it's always interesting even no matter how early i get up in the day there's always going to be people up early starting like sending in like discord or slack or twitter or whatever all these platforms run i'm always like okay i got some stuff i gotta read to start the day i'm never i'm never the first one up so i'm just like you know what i'm west coast it's, it is what it is <laughs> listen man it's like i guess i just uh, come Monday night football, just all I ask for is just send your T's and P's to us East Coast dads. Yeah, I love um, how JJ does that. He's always like, it's it's too late for us East Coast dads. Just we got to end this game right now. Yeah, exactly right. Just it's a reminder. It's, it's rough, it's, man. It's, 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 it's rough. Especially that first uh, Monday nighter of the season. That's the one that gets me every year. Right, starting like 8 o'clock for y'all, and I'm just like, sheesh, I feel bad for you guys. Especially like you have children like that's yeah. a lot harder and it's it's, it's rough so easy yeah but hey it's, we do it for the love of the game right right i know i was talking to one of my buddies who actually lives in amsterdam and produces content and that's a whole nother spiel where he's up at the wee hours of the morning like <laughs> it's just I, felt so bad yeah. I was like being an international football fan i don't i just i mean i you could argue one could argue they're bigger fans than any of us right because you have to be like you don't have a yeah. choice with it so it's just it's so interesting with that but so i wanted to kind of bring you on just talk about basically fantasy football in general and your passion for fantasy football because that's very evident as we are in a league together that we've been through dynasty for a while um which we linked up i was i can't remember exactly which website it was on that we linked up on but getting into that league with you and that group of guys has actually been a lot of fun and i thought it would be a fun thing to touch base on is just kind of what motivated you from initially to start playing like where was that time in your life where you're like you know what i want to jump in fantasy football and see what this is all about because I know for like myself, once I got into fantasy football, I was like, whoa, this is something special. So I got yeah. just all the way in. So why don't you just give me the rundown on what, what drew you into fantasy football? Yeah, man. So uh, what started with me, I, I grew up, I, I never played football. I, I, yeah, I'd play pickup football with friends and stuff. Like I was always like really active um, and, and I wrestled a lot of my life. I've been skateboarding for 26 years now. Um, so that was always my big passion. So I, I never played a lot of actual sports outside of wrestling. Um, Always wanted to play football, but just never got around to do it. And I got into fantasy football, actually. It was around 2012, 2011, 2012. And it started initially, I was a big, diehard fan of the show, The League. It was just, I love Nick Kroll. Um, I, lo I love a lot of guys. And I used to watch it. And it was one of those shows that made me laugh so hard, even though I didn't fully comprehend what they were truly talking about. And it started with a bunch of my guys who I skate with. Um, were one man down and they needed somebody to join their face football league. And they asked me and I was like, man, I've never played before. I kind like the, the names I knew in football outside of the big names were just names I heard from the league. Mm -hmm. And I liked the idea because I'm just a really competitive person of trying to win something that I didn't have any knowledge in. And that just motivated me so much. Like I'm going to try to win this whole thing, even though like some of these guys had played before some hadn't, but a lot of them had. So um, I joined and then I think I just consumed, I had like a 45 minute hour commute to work every day. And I just listened to every fantasy football podcast I could, um, you know, from like ESPN's fantasy focus mm -hmm. uh, to the fantasy footballers. And there, you know, like when, obviously when they started getting around um, and I just tried to consume as much as I could. I remember at the draft, I was like thinking of guys that the league talked about in the show um so it, it was a lot of fun and i think that year i think i took third um so i got really close and i was like man that was fun like i almost made it um and then 
from there, I just kind of got hooked. Like I, I was, it was the first time I actually sat and watched, like truly watched football outside of the Super Bowl, and having players to root for and whatnot really kind of drew me into the game, and it helped me understand the game a lot more too. Like from a like X's and O's standpoint, and as the years have gone on, I've kind of grown more smart to it. And uh, yeah, I just, I just it hooked me. Like yeah, I I very much enjoy the league because that's the first time my wife understood kind of. They did a good job of like telling the world kind of why us degenerates love fantasy football. Cause yeah. it's like, it's more of a yeah, bonding experience. You know what I mean? Right. It's yep. not just about the head, but it's the group of friends are always. So like my wife and I would sit down every week and watch that show. And I was like, Oh, you like this? She's like, Oh yeah, it's hilarious. But she's like, I actually understand why you like fantasy football. And I was like, Man, you like it. cause yeah. before she'd be like, why are you spending so much time playing fantasy football? I was like, listen, I'm doing my best to explain this, but obviously you don't get it. So like having that visual medium show it to her, I was like, I'm I think I think it did it did its great job at like understanding like how it consumes your day to day. Yes, I think that was the best part about it. it. Was like you know these guys like in their early 40s, you know, nice jobs, and yet all they can think about all day is setting your lineups, making trade. And it's like it is true, and it, it really is like that in the fantasy season. So no, that that's what started. But no, I have a I always say a unique entry, so I always try to get new people in have friends and family join leagues, you know, to get them in, even if they've never played. Cause I always use myself as an example. Like I knew nothing and kind of got hooked from there. Yeah. It's, it's, you would be surprised how depending on no matter where you come from, if you enjoy certain aspects of like competition, camaraderie and these things, you might not even understand football in general, but we're fancy football, but like it has those pillars that can draw anyone in from any perspective. And that's why you see people from, other countries who never really heard of football and they just start doing this and they're like, this is incredible. And I'm like, I'm like, is there even like a football league in your league? And they're like, no, but this is great. I'll stay up till two, three in the morning. Just, just watching this. And I'm like, yeah, like it's, it's, it's very hard for, to like explain it, but I think shows like that do a great job of just highlighting the, the awesomeness of it in general. Yeah. So I wanted to, because we, we are in that dynasty league together. So I want to talk about yeah. where, what was that leap you decided to go? You're like, you know what? I'm going to dive into this even more ridiculous, this more over the top 24 seven through 65 league where it's just all encompassing from jumping in from redraft to dynasty is going in from the shallow pool to the deep end really fast yeah. because it's a whole different world. Right. So I kind of wanted to get what pushed you into going into dynasty. So that, and I actually do recall how we got into that. Uh, we were in a discord group together. If you remember, it was a discord and, and they, someone, I can't remember who started it, but somebody started it within that group. And I, I, I I've only done redraft really my whole fantasy life. And I was like, mm -hmm. I was so like just hooked and I just wanted to, that was fair. I thought that was like the perfect time to try it. Cause I'm like, all right, I can invest in it. Like uh, it's a free league. Like, like you said, it's just a bunch of us guys. And it, it's been a lot of fun, but um, it was just kind of the same thing. It's what got me into fantasy the first time. It was like, it's this thought of the, I know a lot about fantasy, but it was still kind of an unknown factor. Of, Ooh, dynasty. Mm -hmm. I knew dynasty was completely different um, from, especially from a drafting standpoint and the startup side and, and everything. So it was same thing. It was the idea of like, all right, it's a new challenge. Um, and I, it was fun because, you know, I do, I've hit, I had hit that point where like, I love fantasy so much where when redraft was over, it was like, man, I could still keep thinking about it. And da dynasty was that first entry into like, sweet i can actually care about it 365 as opposed to just when redraft season comes around um so it was another way to just stay in the conversation to talk about fantasy more um so that they were saying thing. that's that, that challenge i like the idea of a new challenge and uh if, if, if you recall the first two years i went to the championship in both years yes and lost in both years <laughs> unfortunately the second one to you yeah um but I was yeah. riding some lightning that those back to back weeks with Joe Burrow. That was that was some yeah. fun. Like he's putting up forty plus. I was like, listen, we're just this is how it's going to be. Sometimes I felt I felt bad I, I looked, because your team was I look, dominant. Yeah, I was like, I looked, I, looked back. I looked back on that first year I made the championship, and like I think I was like I think I only had two regular season losses. Mm -hmm. Like my team was so stacked. I remember looking yes. at it, especially with the way the scoring was set up. Uh, I had Mark Andrews and Darren Waller at their peaks. And it was just, it was a tight end premium. And I just, I was just staring at it like, and then, yeah, I think I went to the championship and it was like the one week my team just absolutely crapped the bed. Yeah. And I lost to the guy that snuck into the playoffs. Like he was like the last seed. 
So yeah, that it it kind of was that way for my team like last well, two years ago, or whatever you ever want to. Um, yeah, my team was kind of got lucky towards the end. Like they got hot right at the right time. Like they were yep. good. I think I was like the three or four seed, but like I didn't feel confident with that team. And of course, you know this can happen sometimes. Like I'll fully admit, there's luck involved. Like who's gonna predict Burrow going for fifty in one week? Like no, that's not a thing. And you yeah. get it. Like you know what? That's that's the nature of the beast. I think that's kind of why we also love fantasy because there is that random element to it. Case yeah. in point, Mike Evans last year when he went off for freaking fifty-two points or whatever. So if you were yeah. starting him, it's like basically an auto win. <laughs> like is it's just how it is. And I think that that draws us even more because no matter what, you could win a week even if you're project to lose by 40 sometimes you can still win a week so i think that part of it is we'll see us no matter what and that's my pitch to get new people into fantasy too is like right. you know i can i can do all the research yet there's that one person that'll auto draft and make it to the playoffs right and exactly there's it's maddening but it's what keeps you coming back right i love how we will like it's particular if you do mock drafts a lot you'll hear people constantly complain about the mock drafters and how they draft but then you get into a regular season and if someone auto drafts in that situation, like their team sets up really well. And I'm like, well, obviously there's a discrepancy here. They're doing a good job setting it up the algorithm for those yeah. drafters. So yeah, I do. I do enjoy that. I had that happen last year, just too many leagues missed the draft. So it set up auto draft and I had like a queue set up or whatever, but yeah, it drafted a very good team for me. And I was like, Oh, okay. This is yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, But you were talking about analysts and like research. So I'm curious, when you're doing your draft picks and like building your teams out with your process, um, what like specific methods and strategies go into that for you? Uh, good question. So I'm, I've, especially I'd say more so really in the past few years, I've really gone with more of a, I have like, not to steal their shtick, but like, I have like my guys, like guys mm -hmm. that I'm just, I will, I will die on the hill. on. Like I'm going to be right or wrong and I don't care. I'm going to take them as many times as I can get them. Um, and then I, same thing. It's the same idea with guys. I just, same thing, gut instinct, whatever it may be. I just want to stay away from and same thing. I, I'll be happy to miss the boat on him if I have to. Um, but I just, I would rather miss the boat than draft them. And then what I felt was wrong comes to fruition and knowing I could have avoided it and I didn't. So right. there's, there's some of that. I, what I, what I've, I done, I do a lot of my own, I do all my own projections. Um, I, I use shout out to Kyle Yates tool. I think it's, a, yeah. it's an, such an easy, awesome tool to use. Uh, so I do a lot of my own projections in terms of like what I, what I foresee a lot of teams doing, um, from a target share perspective. And then I kind of, I sit back and I look at it and see if some of my process will have players who I think is, you know, who I was really high on, who I thought was right. If the stats add up to that. And if they don't, then I try to have to think like, am I missing something? Um, or am I just going to go with my gut? Uh, I had mentioned to you offline a few days ago about I, I'm going to start statting this out. But every year, what I do is I look at what top 10 players there are, and it doesn't matter the position, mm -hmm. and what players the general consensus overall are fading. And every year, one or two of those players that everybody fades are end up being the league winners. Case in point, last year, Josh Jacobs. Mm -hmm. Josh Jacobs has always just been Josh Jacobs. Like, you know, I never really wanted to draft him. No hate on him. I thought he was good. I just never thought he got utilized right. Um, and same thing. He goes in the normal Josh Jacobs draft range. He wins people leagues. Um, and it, it, you, if some people forget, uh, a lot of people, Debo was like that too, the year he had that huge year. Mm -hmm. Debo was awesome talent, but he couldn't stay healthy. So it's like, ah, stay away, stay away. Debo wins you your league. Right. So... I always, uh, I always try to find, keep an eye on the players that everybody's fading and just keep them in my short list of like, have some market share of those guys because history has shown us that some of those guys are going to have an outlier season or just completely prove people wrong. So I've got some players this year that are on that short list of like, all right, who, who are we fading this year? And then what situations could like prove me right where I'm like, there's a situation of a player and I understand why we could fade them, but they could also be set up to win you your league. So I'm going to, I'm going to start trying to actually stat that out year to year from now on. So mm -hmm. I actually have a list of like, here are 10 players that everybody's going to tell you to fade. However, history has showed us they could win you your league. Right. That very much sounds like a Twitter piece. Like, you know how it is. It's yeah. like these five, exactly. And it's, it's just how you word it and how you do it. But 
I agree. There's always guys. In case of point, it's like we both were talking about Javante off screen. He's getting pushed down to obscene levels, and it's been that way for a while. Obviously, I expect his ADP to skyrocket, but he's currently going like in the sixth, seventh round, and at that price, it's like just why not? Like, what's it's not going to kill you if you draft him. And the upside yeah. is far more tantalizing than some of these guys are in that range. So it's certain players you kind of have to be willing to go against consensus because we're on Twitter, and you you'll see it in particular on Twitter. Like there's like this hive mentality where people everyone starts piling on and piling on. They're yep. like, I don't want this guy, and you're like, but what if? You're all wrong about this guy, right? And you kind of have to shift your process. And I think that's a, a good way to kind of refine it and get better at it each year. And particularly yep. with you doing your own projections, I think that's a very good way to do it because you see the difference year to year. I'm like, huh, what went wrong or what went right? And you yeah. slowly get better and better and better. And comparing yourself to like if you go back to time, like when you first started, you see how you did stuff there and you're like, wow, I've come a long way. And this is it's, where it's at now. Yeah, it's night and day different. I think. The biggest thing that my projections help with is it helps me tell me uh, team trends, right? So I can look at, like, for instance, I, I just statted out the NFC South. Being mm -hmm. a Saints fan, I just did that division first. And statting out uh, Bijan Robinson, and I can look at what an Arthur Smith offense does, and that will give me a very good, like, base plate to know yep. what I can see Bijan finishing with. Um you know, obviously there are, are variables that, you know, we have to expect, but it, it helps me know, like, all right, I know how much this team is going to run. I know how many plays, run plays they are going to run year over year. Uh, the Ravens were always easy because obviously Harbaugh has been the coach for so long. So it's just, mm -hmm. I can see for a five-year sample of how many plays they run, how many pass plays, how many run plays. And I can get a good median average and then just kind of go from there. Um, and then, it, you know, I bake in how I feel about a player in terms of efficiency and touchdown luck and things like that. But it's a, it's a fun process, man. I, I always enjoy this time of year, staying up late, statting out teams. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's just, I mean, if you're truly a degenerate, this is something a lot of the degenerates are going to love, right? You just fully dive into all of the data. And not everyone does projections. Like, cool, if that's not for you, that's not for you. But if it yeah. is for you, there's so much research you can you can get into the weeds. Like, you can go all the way or as far as you want to go. But I think when, when you're doing projections, it's interesting. When you do the flip side, when you have new coaches with new players and new schemes and new talent, like how do you go about doing that? Because in certain situations, you can yeah. overreact one or the other and your projections can come out completely wrong where you're like, okay, here's what's going to happen. Case in point, last year, like I was, I projected the Eagles offense with like Jalen Hurts and I was like, holy crap, I got him at QB4. This is way too high. I was like, there's no way this could happen, right? So I, I was like, I didn't trust what I did there. And then I just sure. watched it happen, and I was like, son right. of a biscuit. I should have trusted myself. But, you know, sometimes you get on the platforms, you hear, like, very important people saying things, and you're like, oh, they obviously know what they're talking about. Like, I'm just a guy. You know, I'm not that. You know what yeah. I mean? So that's kind of what you have to check yourself on and see, like, is, is my process good? Do I trust it? And then if you ride with it, there's money to be made if you're playing process or if you're just, you know, it's there's where it's at. No, 100%, man. We uh, – uh, we have a, I have a buddy, we call it the Jamar Chase rule. Um, uh, shout out to Matt Susie. He's in our dynasty league. Actually, he's my buddy who I brought in last year. Mm -hmm. But uh, we we spoke, it was it was Jamar Chase's rookie year, and it was during the offseason when he his ADP got knocked down because the NFL ball was different and he mm -hmm. couldn't catch. And even though pre that, we were super high on him. Like, yeah. this guy is going to, you know, the, the guy who's dominating the league right now, Justin Jefferson, this was the bigger, stronger, faster version of him in college. Right. So it's like, why shouldn't he be bad? Like, this doesn't make sense. And then we let that, that like you said, those Twitter hives kind of infect our brain and how we thought. We didn't draft him much his rookie year. Case in point, we were wrong. So yes. since then, we call it the Jamar Chase rule. If you have a conviction on a guy, just stick with it. Don't, mm -hmm. don't veer off. Yeah, I would say it's always nice to listen to people, but like you don't want to do it to the point where you're completely changing everything you're thinking. Because yep. there's nothing worse than going like trusting you're going in the process, changing, and then being right in the end. Yeah, you're just yep. like, oh <laughs> my gosh, this is just it, it eats at you. It's like he, he I, to this I, day can't live it down. He is. I, yeah. I believe it. It's just he, some of those times you're just like, man, this is brutal. How did I just? Did you just shake your head. You're like, well, that's a learning potential right there. Yep. that's the only thing you can do with it. 100% man. Um, but speaking of like listening to people and analysts or content creators, are there certain ones in particular that influence the way you build your team? 
um, are there any like experts on whatever platform you want to talk about or any, you know, the big leagues, any place like that? Um, I would say some of the, 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 the guys that I, I think I, I give most of my time to, especially from like a podcast standpoint, um, Kyle Yates is, is a, is one, mm-hmm. uh, obviously the fantasy footballers is, is it's just a, it's just a good listen. I, I, I do like theirs just from, I like the fact the three person dynamic, because at least you can get three different people and how they work out their difference. You know what I mean? Like, cause th- those conversations are, are sound very similar to, I'm sure what all of us have with all of our friends. Mm-hmm. Um, those just three friends sitting there talking about, you can see how each, each of them can have a completely different conviction on a player. Um, so I always like listening to that and how they kind of talk through their differences on certain players and how they also may agree on certain people. Um, Another one that I, I think is is always has been a good one that I've been a fan of for a long time is actually Pat Mayo. I, I listen to all of Pat Mayo's stuff. I'm just a fan of the channel, but yeah. uh, but I, I also like his more blunt approach too, of yeah. like, hey, you know, I don't like a player. I'm just not going to like them forever. Like, don't need any rhyme or reason to it. I'm sure stats can tell me I'm wrong, mm-hmm. uh, but at the same time, don't care. Going to stick right. with it. Um, it. So. So I do, I do like uh, a lot of Mayo stuff. Uh, it's just more of a good entertainment. But from an analytical standpoint, I'd say Kyle Yates is one I like to listen to a lot. Um, footballers are another, and then just yeah, whoever I catch on on either YouTube or Twitter, that kind of catches my eye, and yeah, I like those... to, I like to see everybody's process. You know, even even the the those who will not be names processes who I think we can disagree with and how they go about a lot of their stuff. I, I always uh, I find it interesting because I'm like, yeah, you got some valid points. Don't agree with how you go about your stuff, mm-hmm. but I see what you're trying to do. Um, it's just, yeah. So those are some guys that I've always liked to listen to, but I, I've come to the point of I just like to listen to everybody's opinions on stuff, and then I see if they either match what I feel or if they're way off. And then I kind of, you know, I usually am just going to go with my gut regardless. Alvin Kamara is a, is a big one for me this year that I think on every podcast, everyone is acting like he is 37 years old and is, and I'm just, it's to me, it's mind boggling. And that takes my fanhood out. Like I'm a diehard Saints fan that yeah. taking my fanhood. I just don't understand it. I, I can't see where they're coming. I mean, they talk about the guy like he's been washed up for the past five years. Right. And it's like, I mean, I don't know. I saw that preseason game. I'm like that looks like Elvin Kamara to me like it's it's just weird I guess I don't know yeah it's I was more my issues was how he was used they were more using him as a grinder and I was like dude sure. get this guy in space I mean he still saw 20% target share so it's not act like he yeah. wasn't seeing targets you know what I'm saying so yeah like I I just hope that usage changes where they more let him get in space which where he's super dynamic and he's one of the most like elusive running backs in the league right he's he's not I don't think he's that old also he's he's getting up there but he's still got years 28 like, but yeah it's like you know we just saw Austin Eckler do that at freaking RB1. It's like – Exactly. And it's – I mean, obviously, I don't expect the RB1, but, like, he can drastically outperform his ADP of where he's currently going. So, Well, yeah, and, and he always, to me, has the ability, and this is something I think is, is slept on, and you kind of – Austin Eckler and him have this in common. They shared a backfield most of their career. Mm-hmm. Um, so unlike your Zeeks and your Derrick Henrys, who have just been every down grinders – and just getting pounded on. And we've seen the decline. Like we saw, we've seen Zeke decline over the years. Um, but Alvin Kamara, when you really look at, yeah, outside of last year, I would say, yeah, last year he kind of got used more as a grinder. Also last year, they didn't really have an option. Yeah. So we really didn't weird. really have any, we didn't have anybody behind him. And it was just, it was all bad all around. But, you know, he shared most of his career with Mark Ingram. Eckler shared most of his career with Melvin Gordon. Like he, he hasn't been beat up as much as some of these other guys who are at the same age as him. Um, so I think he's got a lot more tread on his tires. Um, I think we saw in that brief glimpse in the preseason game, a lot of offensive changing for Pete Carr, Michael, which again, need needed to happen. Derek Carr is going to help a lot of that having Michael Thomas year two Olave. So a lot, a lot of, a lot of good vibes coming out of there. And again, I think we actually have a running back room now where we can start to use Kamara back to how he was used before. Get him in space, you know, don't run him up the middle, use Kendra Miller and, you know, Jamal Williams for running up the middle. Get Kamara in space. It's like, yeah, use the guy to like what he excels at. <laughs> he's exactly. been one of the best, the best pass catchers to come out in like the last decade, and he's proven that throughout his career. So yeah, if they want to get him in space, like it's only good things that could come from that. So 
hundred percent with you on that. Like it's in dynasty people are like, I'll oh, just sell them for a random second. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to take the production of my contending teams and just ride it into the grave. If it burns me, it burns me. I don't so care. I'll like, go he, down with the ship. Yeah. You, you see him. He's all swagged out. I'm like, look at that swag. Like sometimes yeah. that just is going to lure you in. I'm like, you know what? Jesus, it's too good. I just can't. Turn I just haven't seen the physical decline that I've seen from other guys. Like I watch him run and I'm like, he looks like Alvin Kamara. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not seeing the decline, you know, people can use some numbers, but again, I, like I said, I kind of throw out last year as a yeah. as a throw and he's in if you think about it too from a career standpoint the guy's been healthy for most of his career like he has not like had any major injury that's mm-hmm. kept him out of season like he's really been a really healthy back and i think it's just because he has kind of split that backfield and the way they've utilized him and deployed him right and it's the rushing was never like his way to succeed anyway. no it was like he was it was a part of his game yeah obviously but like we both know how he was winning and in ppr leagues like that's exactly what you want you want those age guys that can age gracefully out the league and I fully believe he still has a couple years where he can do that. No problem. 100%, man. Um, so for, I would say for you, what's what else like drives your passion with fantasy football? Is it, and this maybe involves getting into social media a little bit, but is it like the social aspect when you get into that with everybody? Or is it more the competitiveness you were talking about? Or is it maybe a combination of both aspects? It is it is both. Um, I, there is a camaraderie, especially when you're in those long time leagues that you've been in for, you know, eight, 10, 12 plus years. Um, and especially when the leagues essentially remain the same with all the same people. Um, there is just that fun competitive slash camaraderie about it. Um, it was kind of the reason I had been in skateboarding for as long as I have been. Um, it was just, it was competitive within myself to get things right. Um, and there's the camaraderie, like skateboarding is all about camaraderie. That's kind of what it's based off of. But being competitive, it allowed me to drive myself to get better every time I stepped on my board. Fantasy football has a lot of that in it for me. It's I love the camaraderie, yet I love being competitive with others. Um, and it's honestly, I think another fun fact is just it's like you mentioned earlier, it's the randomness. Like you can be there is no such thing as like I'm great at fantasy football. I think you can be good, but there's still so much left to chance because you're still essentially betting on a not scripted football game. Um, and, you know, I always think of like that Julian Edelman catch in the Super Bowl. Like if I could ever eclipse what fantasy football looks like in a football play, it's the Edelman catch. It's like that right there. That's when you're up going into Monday Night Football by like 60 points and – Somebody has, you know, the, you know, there's that Drew Brees, Eli Manning game from 2015 where he throws seven touchdowns. You know what I mean? It's like there's just it's such this variance. Yeah, there's this variance you cannot predict. Um, and I think that's what's so fun about it is that you can do everything and get statistically as accurate as possible. Yet, you know, one play can change your whole season. So, yes, and it's <laughs> it's. It's the it's almost like the unrealistic expectation of like to try to be perfect at this, knowing that it's unattainable, but you're still going to try every year to get better. Mm-hmm. So and honestly, you know, uh, especially more so now, just being a dad of two, like I'm just home a lot. Like I'm getting older. I'm in my mid 30s skateboarding as much as I love it. and I still do it. I I've hit that point where like a NFL running back, I can't do it to the level I used to 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And. I, I, I need to take that energy that I put my whole life into skating and I've slowly kind of maneuvering it over to fantasy football yeah. because I need to have that thing because uh, my whole life's been about skating. And I guess I never envisioned there would be a world where I wouldn't have it. And I'm starting to hit that point in my life where it's like, oh, I've, at some point I'm not going to have this anymore. Mm-hmm. And I need to find my next thing that I can put some of that like side energy into and Fantasy football is easier for me because I, I can't get hurt and uh, I'm home a lot with kids. So and, it's something uh, very easy to do. People ask me, how many, how, why are you in so many leagues? I'm like, it's easy because I'm home. Mm-hmm. So I, all I have to do is look at my phone and it's right. pretty simple. It, it'll, it'll draw you in. And I think that um, like you're talking about finding a way to take that competitive nature of something you've been so passionate about and putting it into something else. I think fantasy football is a good outlet for a lot of us, and particularly the people who go as extreme as we do with the dynasty leagues and all the, the DFS and the best ball and all of these leagues where you're looking at your phone and like you're scrolling through sleeper. I'm just like, Ooh, this is a lot of leagues, but I'm like, there's a mm-hmm. reason I do it. It's obviously I'm yeah. finding that because like I play sports my whole life, but you, like you say, you get older. It's, it's 
not as easy to do things you did before. So you're like, you know what? Let's find somewhere else to hone this this thing I need to use and just put it into fantasy football. And it, I think it it serves that perfect purpose for a lot of us. I would say in this space. Yeah. No. It's it, like I said. It's just it's weird because you know, like I told you earlier, like I I wrestled for a lot of my life, but I didn't really play any other sports. I was just so consumed by skating. And uh, yeah, once I once I hit age thirty, I started to maybe think about it, and then you know I'm almost thirty five, so I'm like. I would say almost 35 in skateboarding is basically, you know, 49 in real life. Yes. Uh, so it's <laughs> very much so it's tough. So yeah, now I'm just like, all right, well, where can I put some of this focus, this hyper focus and energy? And it's uh, so yeah, my, my drive for fantasy, if anything, just grows year over year. Yeah. I agreed hundred percent. It's funny. Like my, my dad, who's super competitive and in the sports, like at a certain point he couldn't do the sports anymore. So he's like, what can I do? That's still physical. So for his version of fantasy football, it's just bowling. So it's interesting, like you'll, you'll yeah. find people that just take what they love and they just tweak it a little bit. It's like, hey, I can still do this. And you still get that competitive outlet and you get camaraderie with friends, which when you just still fancy football, like that's what it's all about, right? You're trying to win, have a good time with people that you know and just enjoy it. And like, yep. how do you consistently find ways to improve your fancy football skills? Like, do you seek out new resources on Twitter or what's your way of going out to improve yourself year over year? Um, I, I for my biggest thing, um, because I, I think from a, you know, obviously from Twitter to just just constantly listening to as much uh, content as I can, just I like to hear, I get like I said, I like hearing everybody's process and mm -hmm. then maybe finding ways into like how maybe I can incorporate some of that thinking, maybe something I just never thought of, um, like a new perspective. Because uh, as we all know, you know, sometimes we can be stuck in a process and be like, no, my process is right um, and be very convicted by that. And I, I'm very guilty of doing that. Hence, you know, some of my my debates with friends about fantasy football can get heated sometimes because I can just be so convicted by like, no, you are wrong, I am right. And it's mm -hmm. the same way for them. So, just try to be more open minded, like ever, you know, hearing a different perspective um, on whether it's a player, or a team, whatever the case be. And, and then, honestly, it's just the the end of the year results. I just try to think think to how I thought in the moment we're in right now, the, the pre draft and draft season. Um, and then at the end of the year, try to think of like, okay, yeah, like maybe I should start pivoting in, in terms of the way I, I feel about certain position groups or whatever the case be, or maybe just how I draft um, and, and way of thinking. Like I'm, I'm a big get, get the quarterback like from a quarterback position. I, I'm always a big, like, give me the guy that is poised to break out into a top five quarterback that's going later. And I've hit, Almost every year. Uh, last year, it was Jalen Hurts for me. I was uh, th this moment he took over that offense. I had a big argument, and I still have the screenshot from my my friend group of like I said, I was he's going to be a top five fantasy quarterback. And this mm -hmm. was you know before he could throw apparently, and yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like again rushing quarterback doesn't really matter. Um, at the same time, and then when they added AJ Brown, I started thinking. I'm like, well, he's in. He was in his third year what happened in Josh Allen's third year. They give him Stefan Diggs, Jalen Hurts gets AJ Brown. And I started to just kind of think of that trend. And I'm like, well, every year Jalen Hurts got better. He looked better each year he played, even before AJ Brown. And then you give him AJ Brown. And I'm like, okay, he's looked better each year. He's in his third year, which is typically when we kind of see that lift off. We saw it with Kyler when he got DeAndre Hopkins. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, I'm noticing this trend of like third year quarterbacks who get an X receiver do really good. And he did. So um, that's been a process that's worked. Um, processes that haven't worked for me are, are fading guy, your, your Derek Henry's and like your Nick Chubbs who I love the players, but like I have such a half PPR PPR mindset mm -hmm. of like, if you're not going to catch a screen pass every game, I don't want to know your name. And yeah, right, that's exactly. why, like, I've missed the train on Derrick Henry now. Uh, funny thing is, I was actually in on Derrick Henry his first two years when he was behind DeMarco Murray. Oh. And I just, it was funny. So the two years I was actually in on De uh, Derrick Henry was prior to him actually getting the starting role. And then <laughs> I gave up on him after that. So and then he blew crazy. up. And then I was like, ah, oh, whatever. I've missed the boat. Yeah, so. me too. This is this is actually the one year I've been in on Derrick Henry where it's like, sure. people are just fading him to oblivion. And I'm like, Listen, I don't care. Like he's gonna produce some points. So and yeah. if he I so I, I finally got a share or two after doing that exact thing for him in the last four or five years. I was like, 
this guy can't keep doing this. This is impossible. I'm like, literally, I know this guy's a freaking <laughs> alien. Like, he's not human. Yep. <laughs> I love the the photo you see him and Mark Ingram next to each other, and he just absolutely dwarfs yeah. Mark Ingram. I'm like, this is a running back. I'm like, sheesh, man, this guy is. Yeah, it's always cracks me up seeing that photo between the two of them. I was the epitome of the meme of he cannot keep getting away with this when, right. when it comes to Derrick Henry. Um, I was in on Nick Chubb until Kareem Hunt got there because I was always pick on Kareem Hunt. Once Kareem Hunt got there, I was like, I'm out. Um, and not realizing that hey, he's still gonna have really good value and still put up RB1 numbers and all this. Like, so you know, that's one of those areas where I need to remind myself, like, at the end of the day, points are points, regardless mm-hmm. of how you get them. You yeah, know, some there's... guys gotta get them by getting 350 carries. Other guys like Alvin Kamara can get 180 carries and you know, finish some, you know, I just have to realize that at the end of the day, they're gonna finish where they finish. It's yeah, how they get but... there, just you know, stop worrying about it. Certain guys are just, they have that stank on them and it's, yep. and it, they're just get faded to oblivion. It's like, well, it's just, you just do the stats and you're like, well, actually like he's not too bad. It's going to be a solid year for him. So you're like, well, all right. I'll, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll get that stank all over me and just write it down and see how it goes. Yep. So it's, it's fun with contending teams in dynasty. Like we're talking about like that. I always enjoy just getting those old guys. I know they're not going to be tradable. It's just like, well, let's just wait hey, and see how this goes. Yeah, exactly. well, yeah, yeah. Like it's points or points. Exactly. So that's what it is. Um, how long do you plan on playing fantasy football? Like you're talking about, you're taking this competitive nature and this desire to take skating into fantasy football. How long do you want to keep playing it? Do you want to play it until you're in your seventies, eighties, or do you, at some point, do you want to kind of just move the fantasy football into something else? No, I honestly, I think this is something I'll just play till the day I die. I just think it's, it's what it's, it's just, I think it's also a, you kind of mentioned about when you get older, like especially in your older age, I think it'd be a good mental exercise to kind of keep your mind young and healthy. Uh, I know like I have a, I have a grandma that's starting to go, it's really going through dementia and it's like, you try to find ways to kind of keep your mind and, and brain activated. I think fantasy football is a good way to do that. Yeah. Um, so I actually think maybe uh, there should be a study done on, on people of our age groups and, you know, maybe Matthew Berry's age of like the beginning of fantasy football. Of, like how do these, I see if dementia numbers go down from people mm-hmm. who play fantasy football. Because <laughs> If it's a really good that, stimulating way to keep your mind going and constantly thinking week over week. Um, no, I'll, I'll play forever, man. Uh, there, there's a, I'm sure you've seen it. There's a cool guy on, on the internet. I love seeing it. It's his dad. And he had, he's collected all of his draft boards since like 19. I'm sure you've seen that. I did. See and that, like, yeah. I love that. I, I can watch that video and it never doesn't make me smile. Mm-hmm. Like, cause I'm like, I love that guy's energy for face football. And he can recall every draft, every draft pick. He'll pull up a draft where, like, that's the year. And it's just, it's awesome. And I'm like, that's me. Like, I want that to be me when I'm 52, right there. Um, is this guy who's kept all these draft boards for the past 30 years. And yeah, it's just, I'm, it's really cool. Uh, I do love the aspect of getting together in home leagues. And I mean, it's obviously changing with Sleeper. Like, people are doing more digital, they're not doing ads where they sit down together yeah. and throw something. But like, if you're able to go sit down with the, your home league, have a good time and draft players Nothing put them on the board. The old school, it's yeah, it's it's the most fun. You can just razz each other, ham it up, and just enjoy yourself. So yeah, I I try to do that every year, at least in one of my leagues, and it doesn't always work out. But two yeah, leagues, yeah, yeah. As you get older, I get it. Schedules are just hard to coordinate with. Mm-hmm. I yep. mean, let alone a couple people. Let you know, ten to twelve is mm-hmm. tough. But uh, no, we have two. We have my home league that I've been in for a long time, and then uh, another keeper league. I mean, it's it's strictly an in person draft. That's awesome. Um, there is no online draft aspect to that, those leagues. So those are, uh, yeah, and same thing. Those are my two favorite leagues to be in because mm-hmm. of the draft process. Yeah, the the home league, if you have a very competitive league with, and it doesn't have to be home league because you're going to be friends from the internet, right? But if you have a group that's all centered around this one league, it really just makes it more fun. Like I get, we love formats and different styles, but nothing beats the, like everyone getting in together for yep. that type of league. So yeah, if I Hundred percent. You could talk to me about thirty-two team league, which I have one of those, and all these crazy leagues, right? But that there's two That's leagues in general, my home leagues. That yes, exactly. That I just it's about the people and the camaraderie, and it's like obviously I want to try to win. Like that's you no know, fancy football, exactly. but that's what it's all about. But um, yeah, I think I I I just very much appreciate you coming on the show today, man. It was a, yeah, it man. was a pleasure chopping it up with you. Why don't you um, tell everybody where they can find you? Uh, so on Twitter, it's, it's, I'm typically, uh, just going to complain about football and mixed martial arts is only two things I usually tweet about. Um, uh, but on Twitter, it is at Mr. Lanchar 89. 
Um, and that's that's really about it. For I usually keep my uh, that's Twitter's about my only. I, I by the way, I will. I'm not calling it X. I will not. That will be my boomer moment. That's fine. Yep. I will take that to my grave. It will never be X to me. It's going to be Twitter till the day I die. But uh, yeah, on Twitter at Mr. Launcher 89. Uh, that's usually where I'll put out any of my fantasy takes slash uh, MMA takes or just reactions usually. Yeah, it's usually uh, me complaining if uh, something w- didn't go my way or really excited when things went my way. Yeah, um, the, the, the tweets pop off on Sunday, right? It's like, yep, there they are. It's like we're watching the football. I 100% yep. get it. Uh, but yeah, um, but yeah, thank you once again for coming on. I appreciate the time. And yeah, this was the Getting to Know series. I think this is the eighth one we've done. So we are, we're steaming through. I hope you all check this one out and I hope you all have a good week. So take care, folks. Have you ever felt? Are you listening? Damn.